Radical markets really took economic theory extremely seriously. It really was focused not on contradicting economic theory, but rather taking through to the logical conclusion the most fundamental pref premises uh, underlying modern economics and showing ultimately how they were inconsistent with the most basic things that have been derived from that economic theory. It showed how private property, which is by many viewed as the core of capitalism, is fundamentally inconsistent with the free competition that is the essence of markets. And it showed how one person, one vote rule, which is usually viewed as the core of democracy, is actually fundamentally inconsistent with the idea of collective government and uh, responsiveness to the public will. Um, and as such, it offered a path to exit capitalism, exit markets through the very economic discourse that brought them about. Um, because it cut to the root of that economic thinking rather than trying to attack it from the outside. The, the key point is that if you want to undermine a system, the most powerful way to do it is using its own internal logic. This is, of course, precisely what the struggles against imperialism have done for hundreds of years. Um, the struggle against white rule in uh, India was based on the values of the West and using those to undermine the concept of imperialism. Um, that is really at the core of the idea of Hegelian you know, dialectics, the critique, the, the antithesis, the synthesis. And while many people on the left often talk about Hegelian dialectics, they don't actually practice it. They don't take seriously the neoliberal logics, the foundations of the systems that they seek to critique. And as such, they can provide an antithesis, but they can't provide a synthesis that can actually supplant it. Now, the thing that is ironic, I think, about the project of radical markets is while I think it was extremely effective at offering a new synthesis, it of course itself provoked a sort of antithesis, a critique that showed a next step that needs to be taken. Um, in particular, radical markets surfaced the central role of public goods. Public goods are at the core of what quadratic voting tries to address. They're at the core of how we should conceptualize of the value underlying most property. And yet, the basic framework in radical markets assumes that there's just a few public goods and that everything else is represented by money. Everything else is represented just by separated individuals, each pursuing their own self-interest. And it gives solutions to the problem of public goods in that context. But the reality is that that's completely inconsistent with the basic premise of radical markets, which is that attending to these public goods and focusing on them can transform our whole society. So radical markets, um, just like the neoliberal discourse before it, sort of runs into its own contradictions and we're working and pushing past that in radical exchange and I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that uh, in what comes up. I think this question of the difference between liberal radicalism and um, 
the, you know, uh, classical version of liberalism is really where you see this contradiction in even the radical uh, markets paradigm emerge. In classical liberalism, the basic concept is that sort of there's some state of nature in which people are perfectly free and that people get enslaved by social institutions and really what we need to do is break down those social institutions to allow people to be free again. Uh, you know, one classic expression of this was by Jean-Jacques Rousseau who said that man is born free but everywhere he's in chains. And I think liberal radicalism really cuts to a very different foundation of what the liberated individual is. Um, in that view, people have always, as long as they've been human, been part of societies. There is no isolated human being. There may be isolated animals in some cases, though not many of those even. But, but human beings are inherently social and political animals. That's the fundamental nature of what it is to be human. Humans really emerge with language, and language is fundamentally social. And so there is no such thing as this liberated individual that we can set free. Instead, individuals start as part of a collective. They start in a tribe. The state of nature is not solitary. The state of nature is tribe-based. And liberation of the individual only becomes possible in the modern period. How does it become possible? Well, Georg Zimmel, uh, one of the great founders of sociology gave a really powerful uh, vision of this, which is that what, while in a tribe, the people you marry, the people you hunt with, the people that you pray with are all the same. In modern society, those may all become different sets of people. You may have political associates, you may have uh, social associates, you may have work associates, and they may all be different. And you may be the unique person at the intersection of all those social circles. And thus it's by that intersection that defines you as a unique individual rather than just as a member of a collective. Thus the possibility of the individual emerges with diversity and social complexity. Thus the support for diverse and evolving social structures is actually one and the same as the support for the possibility of liberated individuals. And liberal radicalism recognizes this, recognizes that in order to have any chance of supporting individual liberty, we must support the flourishing of diverse communities that make it possible for there to be an individual rather than just a collective. Um, and conversely, that social institutions are strongest not when they're a single organic whole without any uh, you know, internal complexity, but instead um, one where those social institutions are themselves given power by the fact that their participants are networked into uh, different uh, other social institutions. So the fundamental idea of liberal radicalism is we can only truly synthesize the sort of collectivist and individualist perspective when we go deeper and defend more fully what is the foundation of both the uh, individuals and the uh, collectives. That the individual, in order to become a liberated individual, must uh, exist within a complex social setting, because that's the only thing that makes individual liberation possible. On the other hand, groups can only be cohesive and strong to the extent that they tie together many disparate uh, individuals and aren't just totalizing or wiping away the structure underneath them. So once we recognize that, we can actually have stronger collectives and stronger individuals at the same time, rather than seeing them in opposition to each other.
That's a great point because we don't. That's a great point because as I just have been emphasizing, the way to make progress in moving beyond capitalism is not a frontal assault as is usually made on inequality or something like this. I think the real way to make progress against capitalism is to show that the very successes that are the core of what capitalism claims are inconsistent with its own theory. To make it impossible to defend the achievements of capitalism on capitalist terms. Um, and that to me is the core of the argument about increasing returns. Anyone, all the libertarian economists will say that the great successes of capitalism come from increasing returns, non-zero-sum logic, cases where we can achieve more together than we can separately. And yet, we know, we know it's one of the most basic results in economic theory that in the case of increasing returns, capitalism and market equilibrium is inconsistent with efficiency. Why is that? Because the basic logic of why markets are efficient is that everyone gets paid their marginal returns. But when you have increasing returns, that means that on the margin, people are more productive than they are on average. And thus that if a company tried to pay them all their marginal returns, it would go bankrupt. Um, and this is just like a very simple logic that I think comes home to anyone. Imagine that you tried to pay to everyone who had created something that added value to the lo your life, how much value they added. How much would you be willing to pay to have a sewer rather than to have no sewer. I don't know, probably a third of your income, right? If you had to go to the bathroom without sewage. How much would you be willing to pay to maintain electricity? I don't know, maybe half your income. How much would you be willing to pay to maintain the internet? I don't know, a fifth of your income. Add up all those things and you get way above 100%. You just cannot pay everyone the marginal contributions that they make in a complex society and still, uh, be able to stay solvent. So increasing returns phenomena, also sometimes called public goods, have to be managed by some sort of collective taxation, democracy type of process. And yet they're at the core of everything that's claimed for capitalism. What do the defenders of capitalism talk about? They talk about Factories. Factories are increasing returns. Put a lot of people together, you get more output than you would if everyone is separately making things at home. What is um, the uh, another core claim of capitalism? Railroads. Railroads. Classic network good. Increasing returns. A railroad between two small cities is not worth anything unless it can connect you to a broader network. Of, of railroads that can take you to many different places. Um, another core claim of capitalism, electricity. Electricity doesn't work unless an electrical grid is built, which serves many people. Classic increasing return network good. So all of the core successes of capitalism, really to, a, to an example, there's not an example you can think of, of one of the, these core advances that was supposed to define the success of the capitalist era, which doesn't feature increasing returns, and increasing returns are fundamentally not efficiently managed by capitalism. So it's by cutting to that core, by seeing at the very foundations of the arguments for capitalism, where it goes wrong, that you have a chance of moving beyond and transcending it. Um, only when we have a theory that can actually reconcile the importance of that sort of scale with the dynamism that we know that market societies have allowed, do we have a chance to actually deliver on the promises that capitalism made at its core, rather than just have a contradiction between the historical claims of capitalism and, and its theoretical foundation.
I think by far the best critique of the um, book is around the uh, problem of this atomized individual and money. All the mechanisms that are in uh, radical markets have some notion of an individual and then some token or money that they use. Um, and these are like two very extreme concepts. There's these completely isolated, atomized individuals, and then there's this totally anonymous, fungible thing called money. Um, and yet almost everything in the world uh, lies somewhere in between. It's, it, it's ridiculous to imagine that um, there's just some global currency and some isolated individual, when in reality, almost all of the social relationships we have are not in some global public good um, or in some global democracy, but in a whole range of intermediate uh, public goods uh, in involvements that we have in communities, in families, in cities, in nations, in networks, in software protocols, etc. And this really affects almost all of the core proposals in radical markets and really creates major problems for them. So for example, in quadratic voting, there's this notion of uh, you having some token and the square roots of the tokens you give being added to the square roots of the tokens that other people give added up across the individuals um, so that if many individuals contribute tokens, uh, there's more value than if a smaller number of individuals contribute tokens. But then a basic question ha comes, which is, should me and my wife be under the same square root or under two different square roots? Are we one individual or two? Well, the answer is neither quite, but we're probably closer to being one person than to being two separate people, because almost everything we enjoy, we enjoy in common. And therefore, if you treat us as separate individuals and you try to solve some like public goods problem between us, you're going to end up just subsidizing our lifestyle because we each benefit from almost everything that the others benefit from. But then you could ask, are me and the other people in radical exchange under two square roots? Well, probably closer to being under two square roots, but not quite because if they benefit, it benefits me and it supports radical exchange and, and so forth. Are me and other people at Microsoft? Well, maybe a little bit more under different square roots, but again, we're closely working together. So. This purely individualistic notion where you just have each individual on, under a different square root doesn't actually reflect the nature of what I actually value. It's not all valued for myself. It's valued for the other people that I share public goods with. And um, so you need a richer notion where people are sort of partially the same and partially different. Another example is salsa or cost or Harburger tax, whatever you want to call it, this system of property ownership where um, I pay a tax um, on my self-assessed value and I have to be willing to sell it to someone else. But who is this someone else who I sell it to? Is it anyone in the world? Is it anyone in my nation? Is it anyone in my town? Is it anyone in my company? The uh, reality is that those are very different questions. And in fact, I am going to sell it to someone who's going to have to follow certain rules. But those rules are defined by the community within which we sell it. And on the other hand, you might then want that whole community to maybe ha have to assess a value for keeping that rule in place and sell it to some other organization. And there might be this whole hierarchy of little taxes being paid to different people and different rights to buy different clumps of things. And all that richness of social structure, uh, which is going to be critical to making any of these ideas work, was really missing from the book. So while it sort of broke down some of the problems with neoliberalism, it maintained a lot of the philosophical commitments to this notion of sort of the atomized individual and the abstracted you know, society and market, rather than understanding that there's all these different layers and that it's actually the relationship among these layers that matters the most. And I think that manifested in the style of the book as well. You know, there's a technocratic style in economics where the role of the economist is that of the social planner to just organize things to, you know, 
for individuals, isolated individuals, to then just go along with. And there's, you know, in some ways the book proposes different experiments, but ultimately it, it sort of has this vision of us just designing a social order. When in reality, the most powerful thing that the book could have done is to actually offer tools of self-empowerment to a variety of different communities. Um, and that's what we're trying to do in, in Radical Exchange. So I think there's a often really mistaken notion that acts of creativity are done by isolated individuals. But if you really look at it, almost all creativity comes from individuals who sat at the intersection of a bunch of different uh, social forces, who were, um, who were at the point of collision between different worldviews, forcing them to come up with something new. Uh, whether that be the way that Einstein tried to reconcile the ideas of, um, you know, the electromagnetism, um, the ether, uh, the michelson morley experiments, um, and the emerging field of quantum mechanics and so forth. Uh, or the way that Marx tried to reconcile classical economics with a lot of the demands for redistribution and so forth. It's Creativity always emerges not from isolation, but actually from collision of different uh, forces. Um, people who are isolated have no ideas to build on, and people who are only part of one community have no way to be creative. So creativity is a result, actually, of social complexity rather than of an individual pursuing her completely independent and unconstrained uh, vision. And so therefore a society that bolsters rich, emerging, diverse communities is going to be the one that most empowers that sort of social evolution, creativity and diversity that we want to try to achieve. Um, and you know you can see this not just from a conceptual perspective, but from an economic perspective even. You know, people talk about the you know value of something like capitalism or venture capitalism or whatever to allow these really creative ideas that won't be recognized until later to emerge. But that's only if they get backing from some wealthy person or if the person who has it happens to be wealthy. That's a very tiny fraction of people. Um, who are getting empowered with the ability to allow these new ideas to emerge. If we can actually create much more diversity than that, many different pathways for people to be funding, which is precisely what, um, what things like quadratic funding allow, um, if you allow the support from those different diverse communities to actually lead to the emergence of an opportunity to do something creative, um, then we uh, have the greatest chance of empowering those far-sighted uh, uh, innovations. So the extreme and pure notions of public goods are uh, the something which everyone enjoys together, regardless of whether they're in some way directly participating in them, and regardless of uh, whether they pay for them. Um, they can't be excluded. Uh, they're not rivalrous. Uh, everyone gets them together. The other extreme is private goods, where 
either I enjoy it or you enjoy it or someone else enjoys it. Um, but the reality is almost everything in the world is um, not, not one of these extremes or the other. It's somewhere in between. It's, for example, something that most people in my community can pretty easily enjoy, but people from further away will find harder to enjoy. For example, I live on a canal. That canal is public property. But is it a public good? Well, not really. Because unless you live in my town and happen to have a house on the canal, it's not going to do a lot of good for you that the canal is there. You might be able to access it, but it won't give you much benefit. On the other hand, for people living on the canal, it brings a huge benefit that's shared among all of us. And even if you think about the most private goods, things that you just consume with your family, uh, or even a restaurant, all of these things actually are shared within a community to a certain extent, but also they have limits on the degree to which they're shared. Um, and the broader distinction really is one of increasing and decreasing returns. Increasing returns are when some community of people can all achieve more together than they could separately. Decreasing returns are where the more people you put in, the more that it actually reduces the benefit to any individual participating. And the reality is that everything is actually kind of a mixture of these things. There's an element of increasing returns, maybe for the people in my neighborhood, but then as you start putting more people into the neighborhood, it starts hitting this uh, decreasing returns. And in order for any vision of a market to work, it needs to put this dynamic of increasing returns and decreasing returns at the very core of uh, how the market system works. Capitalism works purely for decreasing returns, but it's filled in reality with all these increasing returns things. The fact that all of us in the community enjoy a restaurant together if it opens, the fact that we all enjoy my canal together, the fact that uh, protecting the country from COVID protects all of us from COVID. All these are increasing returns phenomena and they're at the heart of what makes uh, markets work. On the other hand, because of the diversity of these different increasing returns phenomena, because they're not all at some single global or national or whatever level, to really have democracy govern increasing returns, it has to have the diversity and flexibility and choice that markets allow for. Um, and therefore, a sort of monolithic unchanging state that tries to manage pure public goods, which is the usual way it's uh, set up, won't uh, really achieve anything either. We need the logics of democracy and the logics of markets to be deeply intertangled with each other, like a DNA helix, not like two opposing forces. They need to be um, constantly interweaving to support the development uh, of the other type of system. And the mathematical logic of the radical markets, radical exchange type designs is precisely to achieve that, to achieve a way of there being this tight interlinkage back and forth between democracy that governs these increasing returns types type phenomena and market, you know, competitive logics that govern their incre decreasing returns property. Economists used to really have this very public facing role. You think of people like Henry George, who actually ran for the mayor of New York City and almost won. People like Milton Friedman, who had spent so much time interfacing with the public, John Kenneth Galbraith. There used to be this role of the economist as the supplier of ideas that were then used by social movements, by political leaders for their own purposes. The economist is educator and communicator. Now, during the neoliberal period, uh, economists increasingly became 
the go-to policy experts. Because neoliberalism said, oh, it's just the market, just let the market work, um, the only people who were thought to be competent to give advice are the technicians who just make sure that the market is working uh, right. So where economics was supposed to be this thing of sort of freeing markets to play out as they needed to, uh, instead it actually became a way of dramatically narrowing the scope and vision of the communication that economists did um, so that they only spoke to uh, technocrats. They spoke as experts to expert policymakers away from the public view. Um, this is what Al Roth has uh, termed whispering in the ears of princes. Um, and furthermore, because economists, unlike business people, are in these nonprofit institutions in the academy, they have a rhetoric of serving the public good. And that rhetoric of serving the public good often exempts them or allows them within the culture to act as if they aren't doing anything to further their own interests. They're just serving the public interest, unlike a corporation, which um, you know might be maximizing profits or something like this. And this has actually led the Economics Academy, I think in some ways, to become probably one of the most corrupt parts of our society because its insulation as allegedly serving the public interest allows it to sort of brush aside and disregard a lot of the concerns about its power and dominance and um, narrow technocratic view of the broader interests of society. And so I think that um, economics, by becoming this sort of technocratic field, by abandoning its social role, has ended up putting itself in a position of both tremendous power and tremendous obscurity of that power from uh, public examination, public scrutiny, public conversation. And I think it's that that we fundamentally need to undo if we want to have a chance of building uh, a more fruitful relationship of economics to the world and a more uh, and an economic system that's more accountable to the public. right that overall we haven't won over most conservative economists, though you'd be pretty surprised by the range of economists who have some degree of sympathy for the ideas. In fact, what I would say is that the most common reaction I get from economists is not, oh, these ideas are totally, um, you know, inconsistent with economic theory, but rather, no, those follow logically from economic theory, but the public will never accept them. The thing that's really ironic in economics is it ends up being conservative, not because of what the theory says, but because of what economists assume, uh, given their social milieu, is acceptable to the rest of the world because they surround themselves in such a conservative milieu. They don't actually follow through the logic of their ideas and offer them to the public because they judge what is politically acceptable, what's socially acceptable by the very conservative assumptions that they never explicitly state, but that are sort of lying underneath uh, a lot of their thinking. Um, but, you know, we don't need to actually win over conservative economists. That's not actually core to what will allow us to uh, achieve a transformation. Instead, what we need to do is to take away from those conservative economists the key logic and arguments that they've used to dominate the public discourse. If we can show that the very economic logic that they've used to advance neoliberal ideas actually leads to something radically different, then they've lost the foundation for legitimating their wealth and, and their power and their influence and their concepts to the public. Um, so the, the goal of taking so seriously the principles that they advocate is not fundamentally uh, to 
persuade them, but to leave them just being dismissive, leave them just being, oh, that'll never work, without the argumentation that made them so persuasive. Milton Friedman, when he came in, was not a part of the establishment. He had arguments that people found really compelling. And if we can show that those arguments actually lead somewhere else, the next generation will be led away. And that's what I've seen time and time again when I present in front of younger audiences. Um, the, the critiques on the other side come off just being conservative or just being dismissive, uh, just being like, well, that will never happen, rather than actually engaging the logic. And that's when you know that you're winning. I don't think I quite describe um, the Radical Exchange Project as a middle path between these things. But rather the way I would think about it is that it's trying to achieve um, what sort of cybernetic communism is all about. Except the problem is it's very hard for cybernetic communism as, as just an abstraction, as an ideal without a description, without a concrete um, a uh, set of algorithms that correspond to it to actually compete with the capitalist logic. Because without an alternative logic to actually just run, it's just much less efficient in spreading itself uh, than is capitalism. And of course, the, this is exactly the sort of formalism that I think has been missing from a lot of the sort of cybernetic or decentralized communist uh, rhetoric and discussions um, and has allowed on the one hand for things like Wikipedia or other online communities that are tied together by people who have this very close relationship to each other to prosper but on the other hand for it not to spread to being a broader social logic. And I think radical exchange ideas, by trying to like put that formalism in place to make it really easy to scale, to make it really easy to describe and for people to adopt, um, it allows for sort of um, that cybernetic communism to have an expression that is as crisp and as meaningful as the unregulated capitalism logic and therefore allow it to eventually uh, win out against it. So I see economics and politics not as two separate spheres, but as each profoundly at the core of each other. In order for the economy to prosper, in order for the economy to grow, we need increasing returns phenomena. We need electricity. We need networks. We need steam. We need railroads. We need uh, factories. We need all the things that come with increasing returns. But increasing returns are inherently things that have to be democratically governed in order to be successful. On the other hand, in order to have more meaningful democracy, we need competition, we need choice, we need flexibility, we need all of the things associated with markets. Um, only once we get past the dichotomy between the political sphere and the economic sphere, or even the political sphere sort of setting up the economic sphere, and realize that instead these things have to be constantly interleaved with each other. They have that at the heart of the success of markets has to be uh, constantly using democratic mechanisms. And at the heart of the success of democracy has to be the use of market mechanisms 
to truly define what democracy is, do we have any chance of either of these uh, principles succeeding? I think the fundamental problem with focusing on sort of global coordination, even though, of course, I believe in coordination that's not just based on nation states and so forth, is that politics is fundamentally multi-scale. And multi-scale not just in a geographic way, but in every other possible way. There are different racial groups. There are different... Um, productive companies, there are different industries, there are different languages, there are different uh, networks. All of these intertwine with each other. And of course, there's millions of geographical scales from a neighborhood to uh, a a part of a city, to a city, to a region, state or province, um, nation, the world, etc. And the problem with so much of politics is it wants to just focus on one scale. It wants to just focus on some global conversation or some one notion of democracy rather than understanding that democracy to be in any way effective or meaningful has to be Federalist, and not just federalist geographically, but federalist in all these other ways, that there have to be this plurality of different institutions interweaving and checking and um, collaborating with each other if we want to have any chance of achieving the type of uh, meaningful politics that we have. And that on the other hand, um, the, the market systems that usually do that sort of coordination across these different institutions have to be themselves filled with Um, democracy and that will achieve progress on issues like climate change, global issues like climate change, only if we have those institutions. So for example, suppose that you tried to control climate change, control carbon emissions, have a carbon tax without that sort of structure that I'm talking about. Well, you'd have to have global surveillance to charge everyone that tax, right? Coming into some centralized authority, that would be totally dystopian. That would destroy uh, that would turn the attempt to impose you know, climate change regulation, which should be a relatively uninvasive thing, into a form of totalitarianism. So only by this sort of multi-scale structure do we have any chance of addressing the broadest, most global scale issues. Um, and that, I think, is a fundamental difference between the radical exchange paradigm and other paradigms, whether they be libertarian, saying everyone go off and do their own thing, but then all the coordination is done by a carbon tax in the global level or something like that, or uh, very centralized paradigms, which say, oh, we'll have one global democracy. Only systems that actually give us this complex, pluralistic, multi-scale, in many senses, governance, allow us any chance of reconciling um, the sort of flexibility of the market with the um, importance of democracy. Thank you.